eight and shit. Oh, yeah. Oh, do I have to press OK for that? This meeting is being recorded. Too. OK, I've pressed OK. Hopefully that doesn't means we don't get lost. <laughs> After all we done, man. Um, Duncan, thank you so much, my friend. It's the first time I got you on prescription punk rock. Um, it's so cool, man. And uh, yeah, maybe for people that are aware of your face, I, I just name you, but people are expecting what band is he who are who the hell are you man i'm ozzy osbourne from black sabbath <laughs> finally we got you us you look amazing uh, man i thought you were way older than that <laughs> yeah i'm looking young for me age what i've gone through with black sabbath yeah 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 <laughs> no man we got duncan from snuff and it's funny because we used to have SNFU in Quebec, so we make a lot of mistakes between those two bands. But we got the almighty SNUFF. My friend, it's a huge honor. A uh, huge fan of the band since uh, I, I learned about you guys, and it's so cool to have you on Prescription Punk Rock. Um, but before talking about the band, the, last, the new stuff, the last record, um, I'm curious, let's get back when you were a kid. Uh, how did you start discovering music when you were a kid? And is there anybody around you that influenced you, parents, friends, or whatever? When I was a little kid, um, my mum was into music, still is, but my mum's into music. Um, I kind of, as a young kid, I got into rock and roll. Um, being... Uh, 10 years old, something like that. Um, uh, yeah, listening to rock and roll stuff, Eddie Cochran, Chuck Berry, bit of Elvis. Um, that was my first port of call around about the same time, glam rock. Um, my favourite band as a kid would have been The Sweet. Um I would. I used to go to Cub Scouts, and I do remember running home as fast as possible on Cub, after Cub Scouts to get Top of the Pops, which was British pop, you know, charts. And that was pretty much the only chance you got to see bands. When I was, I'm talking about early seventies here, so. Um, mid mid seven early mid seventies. Um, yeah, no, I just remember I was always fascinated by music. At school, always fascinated. With a primary school, we'd have music lessons, and I would jump on the snare drum as quick as possible. Um, I'd play anything. I would play anything musical. There was recorder classes lunch times and i would do that as well with anything any sort of music i was there so always fascinated with it i was always i was the cliche of when mum and dad were out i'd get all the pots and pans out and i'd start banging them with wooden spoons um any chance i know my mum had a we had a little piano i i um i had some lessons doing that but i didn't really like that i didn't like lessons i just liked to play about myself my mum had a six string Spanish guitar I remember and I used to pick that up and try and play stuff um, but always fascinated with music always, it was always a thing I remember seeing old folk dancing um, we had folk dancing at school um, we had music lessons, I was always there just straight in, like I said give me the snare drum, give me the snare drum, give me the loud one <laughs> So that was my, yeah, no, I, I was always fascinated by it and always picked up on it. And I guess another story, another thing I remember as well, we had a an oil boiler, which made a little hum. <laughs> and because I like listen to the rock and roll stuff, there was always that, oh, 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 oh. so I do like, rock and roll harmonies with the boiler I remember doing that <laughs> um, always fascinated with music any chance, any chance to do it 
completely got into drums. Like I said, my dad noticed they he'd come back and it's like, what are you doing with all the pots and pans out? So I'm, I'm playing <laughs> drums, dad. So he noticed that and he encouraged me, which was great. Um, yeah, I guess as a young kid, hearing folk, hearing rock and roll, then a bit old, tiny bit older, getting into glam rock. Um, and then hearing rock, hearing some Black Sabbath for the first time. Like, Whoa, what's this? Whoa, Children of the Grave. When I first heard that, that was like, wow, this is this is doing it. This is doing it. Deep Purple. When I heard Deep Purple, Ian Pace is still, I think he's still my favourite drummer. Um, I, I was just always fascinated. Always. It's always was a calling. It makes sense because when you listen to your music, there's so much stuff. And that's what hooked me with that band. At a time where a lot of bands were following the trend of punk rock. And I'm not saying that, you know, it was bad or something. It's a choice. But you choose to do something very different, another approach with ska, with rock, with metal riff and, and instrumental songs. Um, and, and yeah, it, it, it all makes sense. And I mean, I'm so, you're such lucky to grow up in UK. I don't know what's in the water. But man, it seems that every two hours there's a fucking genius musically <laughs> that is born, man. Because everything that went out is it's just crazy how much it influenced the rest of the world. I mean, you mentioned Black Sabbath. I mean, like all the metal riff that you hear now, they all came from Sabbath. They 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 kind of uh, you know push the limit and show that you can do something really strong, really dark and and reach a lot dark of people and heavy dark and heavy yeah um yeah that was yeah so that for for the later influences i'd say up until 12 13 like i said i would watch top of the pops and you'd get it was all pop stuff you just it was the only chance so you you had to watch it to see it um there was no internet there was no there was music papers but i wasn't buying them then Um, but later influences, when I've heard like reggae, I remember my mum brought a, um, I got a Bob Marley album for Christmas. And it was like, whoa, listen to this. This is, this is rocking. And then my auntie Barbara brought a Motown compilation round. And again, whoa, what's this? Com almost the complete opposite of Black Sabbath, but that caught me. So, There's always been a reggae and a, and a soul influence for me. To be honest, most of the music I listen to now is black music, soul music, um, mainly from the 60s, I've got to say. I love the old soul music. I love it. Up-tempo. Great vocals lyrics that you know simple little two minute lyrics about oh you broke my heart or I broke your heart sorry you know, <laughs> it's all all simple little catchy <laughs> little bits which I must admit after like all through my early teens I was into the metal and the rock when I got a little bit older I did I, I still love it but I did start thinking some of these lyrics I'm not sure about this wizard up the mountain stuff anymore. <laughs> maybe I want to, maybe I want to hear something else. And then came the pistols and the clash. And it was like, Oh, they're talking about stuff. That's, that's good. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. It's not, it's not, I'm going to rock you baby. It, it's something happening real. And that, that made a big difference. That was, I guess that connection as well. It was real, like the old soul songs. They were real. They were pouring their hearts out. Um, it all added. I still go back to Black Sabbath and Deep Purple and have a little blast, but mainly I listen to old 60s soul and ska for fun, if that, for my enjoyment, if that's what I want to hear. That I want to hear 60s stuff before music became... Um, how to how to say it, not analogue. It was always analogue. It was the band recorded at the time, live. 
just feels good and you can hear it. Now it's all, uh, it's done to, it's quantized, done to clicks and, and yeah, vocal tune. It, it's too processed for me. I, I grew up at that time, so I'm going to listen to that, I think. I still like some of that stuff, don't get me wrong, but I, I like to hear a natural band with natural emotions. <laughs> You're right. The Clash was all about that. Uh, the Pistol exactly. was in, in the way that they wanted to destroy rock and roll. And there was a, a huge scheme behind the band. But I think the Clash were there to unite every style of music. And I think the importance of the Clash is that they allow people to listen what the fuck they want. Don't care about what you're listening to. Because a lot of people define themselves through what they were listening to. And it broke the border and just said, fuck that. Listen, whatever you want. And I think the most interesting musician, as you as people, has really open mind and don't close door. They all leave the door open and they listen to everything. And with that, they, they built something. And I think that's the case with the band. Yeah, I think so. I totally agree about The Clash. They accepted all sorts of influences. Reggae, soul. They were doing Booker T and the MGs. They were doing reggae. They were doing... They, they took them in the who they they took all them influences in and put it out in their way which makes it interesting if you if you only aspire to copy a certain genre then you're only going to go down in in a spiral it's never going to you're not going to be open to putting something else into it um yeah, I don't know. The Clash, definitely one of my favourite bands. Definitely. And I still remember, I saw them twice. Um, somebody got murdered at the Ham Hammersmith Odeon. I, I still listen to that in my head now. Amazing. It was just like the hair, literally the hair standing up at the back of my neck going, wow, wow. It's it's real. It was real. It, it was honest and real. And you felt it and still do. So... I, I'm an old git now, but I always try and go back to making it a live performance, a live thing with some sort of feel that different influences, but the recording, not to a click, but make it breathe, make it breathe, do it live. So it, so it feels alive. If you quantize it and make it perfect, your ear turns off. Um, which on, on one side is all right. If you want to listen to a dance track, a modern dance track that is just a constant beat, fair dues, that's lovely. But that's not what a rock band should be. A rock band should be alive. And yeah, yeah music breathing. Is a living thing. You're right. Yes, yes. It, it should speed up and slow down a little bit on purpose. Get to the chorus, speed up and then finish the chorus slow down just a little bit into the verse and then speed up again at the end and at the end keep it going a little bit faster a little bit faster finish you, it, your ears hears it your ears hear it. it it's it keeps you entertained mentally so i'm got very very mixed feelings about bands recording to clicks and quantizing it and vocal tune and making it perfect my ear turns off and I go back to the 60s and the 70s and go, no, no, give me something alive. Yeah, because music doesn't have to be perfect. You have to put your soul in it. You have to put yourself in it. And I think that um, a lot of bands have succeeds because they have something to say and they have the passion and the desire and the discipline to do it. I think all those elements combined together can make you a great musician, even if you're not like... Uh, uh, virtuos if you don't play guitar like the Iron Maiden guy I don't think you really need to achieve the perfections uh, I think mm. you get lost in that process too I think you just have to go with uh, with your heart it's it's cliche but it's so fucking true I mean like when Ac we listen accept, to you... accept the imperfection accept it because as a musician I can understand um, when you're recording something when you're playing it live you just play it live and you try and make it as good as possible. When you're recording it, you're thinking, this is what it's going to be for the rest of the 
rest of the time in the world, it's got to be perfect. It's got to be perfect. And so you smooth it out and you end up with a bland product, in my opinion. You, you end up with a flat, boring, bland, lifeless, soulless piece of music. It's got to be wrong. So yeah. I understand when you're in the studio and you hear it go, oh, I, I played that a little bit wrong. Can we fix that? It's because the musician is trying to make it perfect, make it perfect. But in doing that, you destroy the feel of the piece. You've got to rehearse it and rehearse it and rehearse it. Play it live, play it live, rehearse it, then record it. And then you capture the song, I think. So studios are too easy these days. You can go in, make everything perfect with the click of a button. Um, that's not that's not what I want. That's that's and it's not what makes the song good to other people as well. It makes it bland. Put some soul into it. Make accept them mistakes. Just accept that it's it's not going to be perfect tempo. It's going to go up and down. That's that's what human ears want to hear in a rock situation. Yeah, because like with the radio show, I get what people want. What people want is simple song that they can sing. That's the only thing they're looking for. When they go to a show, they want to sing. They want to have a good time. They don't. They don't hear like the mistakes. They don't see it. And you know, it's it's all in the head of musicians to try. Oh, we we screw it up at that part. But people were drunk. They don't care, man. They have a good time. So at the end, it's it's you know the energy you deliver and what they gave you, and it's it's that bed between the crowd and and the band that make it good. Yeah, it's it's a live thing, literally live. It's got to happen there and then. And and I agree. The number of times I finish a song live, and I go, "Oh, I forgot the lyrics," and the, <laughs> and the middle eight, I didn't quite get that right. But oh, whoops! But the crowd don't notice. I'll notice, but the crowd don't. Maybe one person out of a hundred will go, "I don't think he quite got that lyric right." But ninety nine people go. So what? It it finished. It was great. Um, so that's yeah. Make something live happen. Make it real. Make it connect. Because yeah. you hear you hear imperfection, and that's what makes your ear change and go. Oh, did something happen there? I don't know, but it goes on. Whereas if it's all just tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, the ear just turns off. It turns off, and it and it and it goes. Yeah, finished. It's not what you want. You want some accepting perfection. I think there's a famous Japanese word for it. I can't remember what it is, but accepting perfection. And that's what that's what we are. We're imperfect humans. Make it make it, you know, reflect that. People accept that. If you make it live, if you fuck up in the middle of a song, but you still finish the song. There's also a little boost to that. The crowd go, they fucked up, but they finished all right. It's okay. <laughs> Next. So, see, yeah. people, Duncan maybe look old for you, but you have so much experience to share, man. That's what punk is all about. We learn a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, for punk as well, use what you got. Use what you got. Do it live. If I, if I could talk to a young band, do it live. Make it. Just rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it. Play it live, play it live. Record it live. Get the best take. It's going to be mistakes in it. Stick with it. It's, it's going to feel good. Don't fix it. Yeah. Get to the get to a good point. Stick with it. Humans, we, we emotionally will stick to that more than we'll stick to the the perfect version. I think it's it's quite a common thing that bands will demo up songs me included, everyone included, whatever. You demo them up and then you go, right, okay. Then you record the album. You go, right, we've got it perfect. And then you go back and listen to the demos and go, they, they're better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah they are. Happens a lot. Because you're just knocking it out and you're doing it and it's done and it's like, oh, it's a little bit wrong, but then you fix it and it's sort of like, hmm, we fixed it, but hmm. 
it's not as lively it's not as you know maybe sonically in the studio it sounds better but lots of my favorite punk songs sonically they're appalling they're absolute rubbish sonically yeah. you know yeah. actually recordings wise it's just some scruffy little recording in a garage just yeah. the out. germs is a good example i i think the germs record is a really good example it's a kick-ass record but it's so bad in a way but that's what makes the records good it's because it's not perfect and you got like because i think punk rock is that gem that you find in that pile of shit you know you have to dig in that and it's dirty yeah. and then you get the gem and It's there. It's 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 not the 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 song that it the the sounding that is important, but it's what you know the energy and the meaning it's of, of the spirit of it. It's the spirit of it. Yeah, it's that's what because you can connect with the spirit in something. You kind of feel it without knowing. Um. So if if something's got a good vibe to it, a good energy, good spirit, you can connect. It's like oh, okay. Okay, the symbols are too, you know, are breaking up and the balance between the instruments is rubbish, but the spirit, that's there. And I still hear that with my old punk sevens. It's like, if I actually analyze them, it's like, oh, sonically, you know, it's sort of like, oh, blimey. If I listen to it, where's the bass on that? I can't really hear the bass on that. Why is it all just such a big mess? But why does it sound so good? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I guess my favorite example of that would be Blitz. I mean, some of them, them early Blitz sevens, sonically, they're fucking horrible. But <laughs> power wise, it's just a wall of noise. It's like, yeah, there we go. That's it. That's what it should be. Just spirit, wall of noise, power. You connect with it. If Blitz went back now, and well, they, they couldn't because something after them had well, dead and old and blah, 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 whatever. But if they went back and recorded them properly, it wouldn't be the same. It yeah. wouldn't have that same power and energy. It would become right. clean and sterile and all completely in time. It's like, okay, mm, lost something there. So I don't know, punk rock, yeah, do what you can, get it live. Record it live, make it emotional, and accept that it's the imperfection. Accept that it's going to be wrong, because then bits actually make it right. Mm. That's You're what right. I've... That's amazing. The band started up in 1986, if I'm right. Uh, it was another time. It was uh, another scene. I was the UK scene at that time, because... Uh, all we know, we, we know the explosion of punk rock uh, in 77 and a couple of years before and after it went pretty well. But at the beginning of the 80s, it kind of declined slowly uh, here in, in the U.S. and Canada. We still have DOA running, but I think Bad Religion and the Circle Jerks was the main band releasing Suffer um, and, and decent records and keep the scene together. But how was the scene when you started up? Uh, in 86 see in 86 um, it had kind of gone to blast beats um, more metallic in general there were still the original bands were still playing but we were really snobby and thought no they're so past it they're so like, that's, that's two years ago that's gone <laughs> now <laughs> What the hell? How can they still, you know, re <laughs> What do you quite think snobby. starting a band in 86? <laughs> I know, I know. It's only with the hindsight of the years that I look back and go, might have been a little bit too snobby there. Um, <laughs> but um, it was, yeah, it had kind of, the, the punk, the scene I was listening to had gone more to like Extreme Noise Terror. It had taken the Discharge side of stuff the like the UK what is become known as what UK 82 or whatever, whatever I mean I mean it was called hardcore at the time but the, whatever you know it changes it changes um which I love don't get me wrong I absolutely love it and I still get me old discharge exploited GBH singles out um so it was it had kind of 
gone the next step. Like metal, had, it had gone more met, metal. There was a metal crossover mid eighties, early to after eighty two to the mid eighties. Motorhead were always a massive influence on the punks. I most of the punks that I knew liked Motorhead as well. Yeah, because they had because they had a dirty attitude and it, and it was raw and powerful. Um, but it seemed to have gone into yeah more metal blast beats. <laughs> the melody had gone out of it a bit, and I I loved the melody. I loved the melody of the undertones, the buzzcocks, um, the clash as well. But it was more um, it always had a melody to it. The, the yeah. 76, 77, it was kind of rock and roll, backroom, 12 bar rock and roll with an attitude. Um, then you had the wave like 80, 79, 80, you had the GBH discharge, which I, that was my time. That was my, because I'd been into the rock and the metal and motorhead. Then it was like, yeah, wow, amazing. But then it took another step, blast beats. Not just screaming, <laughs> and there was no more melody in it. Um, I wanted more melody back, and it was like the harmonies in a song. It's beautiful. It, it just feels good for me, and I like the soul music and and reggae music, and um, that was one thing. I've, we tried to put some melody back into it. Um, I guess also that time from early days the skinheads were always at gigs um they weren't always nice skinheads which might be a bit of a shock to some people listening to this but the early 80s in london because i i moved to london 81 um my, my, i've got half my family's from london half my family's from the north of england and i personally moved to london when i was 17 you still get a mixture of punks and skinheads at the gigs. Um, sometimes the skinheads would just smash it up and they, they were horrible. Um, so there was a big mix out early 80s because you, I could go to gigs and there'd be a selection of punks and skinheads together and everyone would sort of, if they didn't always get on, accept each other. And then it got the politics of the skinheads went really weird it yeah went, lurched really right wing and and there were loads of fights and smashed up gigs and they would turn up just to smash a gig up then it all separated out and which i'm very glad of myself um so there was that going on as well there was the mixture of like in the 70s the punks would sort of there would be some right wing punks about as well um, that was kind of weird. Um, because they seen um Sid Vicious with a swastika, it was kind of like, Yeah, 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 here we go, Nazis, it's all cool. And they they were kind of like that. Uh oh, I lost you. I don't know if you're still there. Yes, I'm there. Okay, I just can't see you, that's all. But yeah, no, that was the 80s. Um, early 80s, it kind of separated out, punks and skins went their own way. Um, mid eighties, more, more blast, more. Um, yeah, when you don't hear the lyrics, I mean, like, cause th there's, and I, I don't want to say like it's a choice, but when I listen to those, you know, metal band that have lyrics and I don't get it, I'm like, what the fuck do they write lyrics for? You don't get anything when they sing. It's just noise. Yeah. You have to you know, read I love, it. I love when I hear the lyrics that. Like Slayer or Trash Metal, you can hear what they're singing, and I'm okay with extreme music, but when I don't get what you're singing, it's like... Yeah, well, see, I don't mind. I like to listen to like 10 or 15 minutes of the most blasted and screeching... <laughs> I wouldn't know the lyrics. It, it doesn't matter. It's like, oof, there we go. That's good. That's <laughs> enough. I would have to actually look, look at the lyric sheet and go, oh, Oh, they were saying that. Well, people have said that about me as well. It's like, can't hear what you're saying. 
but I can't enunciate. I can't enunciate properly to make oh. everyone understand what, especially when you're singing loud. It's not like talking when you're shouting. It, it, it's it's a different. Words don't come out the same as talking. They're coming out as screaming. And then again, on the other end, I mean, I had the Clash first album for years before I actually read the lyrics. You could get get the emotion of it and you could understand lots of it, but I actually made my own words in my head. It was kind of like, because he doesn't enunciate that well. He's, he's, he's shouting and screaming. So it was a bit of a shock when I actually found out the real lyrics <laughs> to some of the Clash songs. <laughs> and I still sing my that's lyrics what, now. It just, that's, that's what, what they're stuck, saying. <laughs> that's, what, that's what stuck in my head. I got the idea, you know, you could tell the sort of like the emotions there is good. So I'll, I'll, I'll go with that. Blah, blah, blah. And like, oh, oh, that's what he's saying. Oh, okay. Um, luckily, it wasn't the other way. Luckily, he, his lyrics weren't shit. They were good. So it was... Again, it's, if, if you identify with what someone's doing, albeit, you know, deaf grunts or, or someone singing big, lovely harmonies or whatever, if you identify with it, then it feels good. Um, so who am I to say? Music is a subjective choice. <laughs> it's so pick, true. It's so true. And another like. thing that it's, it's incredible about Ben is, again, the, the, the sound was really different from, you know, the punk scene in England, even the ska scene, because a lot of bad people figure that SNU FF is a ska band, but uh, there's more than that. Uh, but um, was it something that came naturally when you get together or is something that you wanted to achieve, bringing something different? Because, you know... When when Fat Mike came and signed you on Fat Track, people were surprised of the sound, but it felt right, you know, to be in the family because there was similarity. So was it natural when when it came to to write song? Um, I guess we were just drawing on different influences. Um, I mean, origin the original lineup, me me signed Andy. Andy was big into his reggae. Um, we were all into the clash. Andy was also into like the darkest, you know, um killing joke sort of side, DRI he was into. Um I was already into the always been into punk for years, but now into Northern Soul, 60s soul basically. That's um 60s scar, um, which we were all into. So I don't think we were trying too hard to make anything. We weren't doing it on purpose. We just did it because that's what we heard, and that's what that's what inspired us. So it's it's nice to have a um an up and a down in a gig. Doing the gig, you have an up and a down, so that you move from one thing to another. So it's not just half an hour, forty five minutes of the same thing over and over because you get bored. You need an up and a down. You need a a change. So that whatever comes after sounds better. If if you just play like straight punk rock, 70s punk rock all the way through, it's you, you're going to get bored. Whereas if you change it so that there's a natural up and a down, it's just more interesting. It's, it's more... And we... I guess we were just drawing on different influences and, and wanted to copy it, which I guess is what all bands and all musicians do anyway. You you copy what you like. So we liked all sorts. All sorts came out. <laughs> I guess that's the best way, I think. And it really worked because every record is different. And, you know, the approach that you have is so interesting and, We need more band like you and we miss you. So I was going to be 2024 for SNUFF. And of course, you keep see saying me SNUFF. You know, it's snuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People you're, say snuff. you're stuck with SNFU. You know? yeah. <laughs> I'm going with the long term. <laughs> yeah. SNUFF. Yeah, so, so But go on. Sorry. Of course, to see you around Quebec and Canada because we miss you a lot. Well, I'm. 
I would love to get back to Canada. We've had over the years, we've had when we have been able to get there, we've had some pretty good gigs in Canada. And I think, yeah, no, and I think there's a good vibe. There's a good kind of um I know there's a Canada America, you know, rivalry. <laughs> yeah, we're Don't... American after all, we're just north. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, North American, South Middle American, South you know, different. Okay, I mean America, Canada, but <laughs> don't tell the Americans, but USA, but we had better gigs in Canada than we did in, in the USA, apart from a few. There was, we've had some good gigs in the USA, don't get me wrong, but Canada <laughs> just feels better to me. I think it's a slightly different attitude. It's, it's more, um, I don't know. Somehow we had better gigs. Somehow they connected more with us. Um, there's places in the US that we would connect with, but by and large, it, they didn't really connect as good as Canada. It was sort of somehow something worked better. I mean, don't tell them. Don't, shh, don't tell them. Don't tell them. We will not. We, we keep that for ourselves. Yeah, keep that secret. <laughs> You know, and, and we have had some great gigs in the US as well. Don't get me wrong, but yes, I would love to get back to Canada. A bit more poutine and get some get some rocking on the go. <laughs> of course, we will wait for you and, and people grab the last records. I think it was released uh, in 2022. It's amazing records. I, I mean, listen to everything they've done. You're going to fucking love it if you don't know them um and and yeah duncan thank you so much it's it's funny because we have so much trouble like doing the interview we spent almost 30 minutes so i make you work so i own you more than 30 minutes i own you a fucking hour of your life <laughs> no worries i think part of that may be my technology skills as well I'm, i'm not good at modern technology i'd rather write it down on a bit of paper that's that's yeah 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 <laughs> but no yeah, my then- pleasure sir Thank you. Next time you're going to come see me and we're going to do it in person. It's always the best. Okay. Yes. Like what? I, I look forward to it. And I, I hear a French accent in your. Is your first language French? Canadian yeah. French? We oui, okay. like fun. Yes, I'm French. Okay. So, Quebec French. Yeah. I, I guess that I could hear the accent. So if I speak French, I'm, I remember speaking French in Canada and people going, no. Nope. We speak Canadian French here, and it was sort of like, okay, I won't, I won't, I won't judge, you know. But we salute. <laughs> Merci. Thank, you. Thank you so much for your time. You are amazing. Merci et salut, mon cher ami. We're gonna wait De for rien. you, of course. <laughs> nice one. See you later. Cheers. Bye bye. Right, nice one. See you later. <laughs> Oi, oi. <laughs> Proper Christian is what you need.